thank you very much for joining me here today. I will be talking about the software delivery process. And so let me start by saying, oh, we do not have slides showing there. OK. So I will be speaking about this, our, software de our experience with the uh, software delivery process. So, and uh, first, let me say a few words about myself. I am, uh, and about the company, I'm the CTO of Rengaleo. So as the, based on the title, you might think that I'm spending most of my days thinking about technology. But in reality, I actually spend a lot more time thinking about our process. And in particular, coming up with a software delivery process that would give, bring our clients the value that they are looking to get out of their engagement with us, while also providing our staff with the kind of positive work experience where people really enjoy working on our projects. So a couple of work, words about our, um, how we got there as a company. So we are mostly known as a JavaScript company. Uh, we, are, we could be potentially be the largest company in the world focused entirely on JavaScript. We've got uh, around se over 70 JavaScript developers. Uh, again, this is people working just exclusively with JavaScript. So that has allowed us to be really f uh, focused on that technology and really um, be leaders in that. However, when, and in particular, we've been working from the very beginning with Angular quite a bit. So that's sort of how we uh, got to be where we were. And our initial focus uh, has been on working on building MVPs with uh, startups. So the idea is that uh, companies would come to us with an idea for an MVP, and we would build that for them fairly quickly and then hand it off to them. So we started in this mode where instead of some consulting companies sort of start with a kind of long uh, project and they, you know, kind of milk this project for, for many years. In our case, we started with a lot of small projects, and we really started thinking early how to make those projects go fast so that we could really go and get this MVP out of the door and move on to the next client. So fairly early, a solution that we ended up settling on was Scrum. And uh, now it took us a while, however, to get this right. And over time, however, we've really come to feel that this has been uh, a great bet and that has really helped us both deliver value for clients and uh, create a work experience that really is very positive for our staff. So where today I often feel that the following statement is kind of true for both our uh, clients and for our staff, where people come to us for JavaScript and they stay for the process. Uh, so what I want to do today is, um, what I really wanted to do today is, focus, is share on some of the learnings we've had. Uh, in terms of adapting Scrum to our experience, in particular to our experience as a, pro as a uh, professional services company. Now, before that, however, I wanted to cover two topics, just sort of as a way of uh, having shared uh, background, common, uh, uh, common ground. So one is I want to talk a bit about why we wanted to do Go Agile and why I feel that this really makes sense. And this is something that I think is sort of taken for granted often today, but at the same time, uh, people actually have different assumptions about why we're all trying to do Agile, and I think uh, getting to some common understanding on this would actually help us move the rest of, the pro of this talk forward. The second one is I want to talk a bit about what it means to do Scrum by the book, because I believe that w while Scrum is meant to be adaptable, it's really important to give Scrum a chance in the sense of really trying first to do Scrum, quote unquote, by the book, and I'll show you the book. And afterwards, I want to talk about adjustments that we've made to the process and learnings that we have um, implemented. So let's start with why Agile. Well, if you th I, th I think we can think of the software development projects that we observe out there in the wild as falling, roughly speaking, into three modes. So the first mode, and this is where a lot of smaller companies start, is the chaos model. This is like the fly by the seat of your pants sort of process. Make stuff up as you go and hope that it works out. And this is, this is probably actually the most common software development process out there. And it obviously doesn't work that well because usually, I mean, you kind of, you end up getting in a situation where you're rushing to finish stuff and nothing really quite works and you are rushing against those deadlines and it's sort of all uh, painful. And so, which is why a lot of big companies have uh, 
shift moved to a process that we loosely call waterfall. Right? Waterfall means that you don't do fly by the seat of your pants. You think a lot about everything, and you plan, and you plan, and then you hand off things from requirement gathering to the project planning to, architect to architecture to project planning to delivery to QA. And all of this is supposed to fix things, but in practice, it makes things worse. Or, or at least doesn't really improve that that much. So and then the third mode is really agile and that needs to be contrasted with both of those approaches. I mean, you need to contrast it with, with chaos, but also with waterfall. I, it introduces some process, but not, that, not as much process as waterfall, quite a bit more process than just the chaotic uh, approach. And then really gives you usually more value than either of those two approaches. Now, how does it do that? Well, the key idea in Agile from my perspective. I mean, different people would sort of uh, promote this uh, differently, but from my perspective, the key idea really comes down to reducing waste. Is basically, and now, and how do you reduce waste? Now, let's think of it, let's imagine that we bring a project manager from hell, who really, whose singular objective is to just derail your project and to just make sure that nothing ever gets done. What would they do? Well, let's think about it. I mean, so they could say, well, you know, let's just tell people to not work that hard. Well, the problem is, I mean, if you tell people not to not work that hard, I mean, they might take some breaks and then they're going to come back rejuvenated and they might actually get more done than initially. So that sort of doesn't really work, right? I mean, what other ideas are there, right? Well, the best strategy is really to put people to work on the wrong stuff. Right? Because if you put people to work on the wrong stuff, then they will be working, they're going to be busy, they're going to feel that they're being productive, and at the end of the day, they're going to get nothing done, or they're going to get something done, but it's going to be totally not what you wanted. Right? So, so this is the lesson that we need to keep in mind. The, the best way to waste uh, energy, to waste resources, is to just build wrong stuff. So what we want to do with Agile is we want to reduce waste by only building what we actually need. Right? I mean, it seems like such a simple idea, but this is really at, at the heart of it. Now, another nuance to this is also by limiting work in progress. And I'll talk a bit more about limiting work in progress. Uh, it's a slightly more subtle idea, but ultimately work in progress ends up stopping you from um, actually building what you need, and it also often just slows you down altogether. So I'll talk about those things in a second. Now, why would we ever build things that we don't need? Well, there are several reasons, right? So developers often they just don't, they don't really know what the user needs and why. So they are, they're working on something and they think they understand what they're supposed to be building, but then at the day of, end of the day when they build it, it's not what the users wanted. Now, there could be a couple of reasons for that. One is that, well, they're supposed to learn what the users want from the product manager and that communication is broken and that's often the case. Now, often on top of that, product managers don't really know what the users need either. And now the product managers are supposed to learn this from the users, and then again, well, sometimes they don't, and then on top of that, oftentimes users don't necessarily know what they want either, right? So, so you kind of get this many different things that can go wrong, but usually the end result is that you have a developer who's working on something, and they don't really understand why is it that they're building this and what is this for, right? And this is the, the way towards building stuff that is not what you need. So how do we fix this? Oh, and the waterfall process really tries to fix this, right? It tries to fix this by uh, introducing this process by which requirements are figured out, but it often makes things worse because it actually introduces those extra steps between uh, the developer and the user. So how do we fix solve this? Well, we want to, and I'll quote here the, um, the Agile Manifesto principles, we want to bring in, the, to get value and feedback through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. The main idea here is that if we're delivering stuff early, and if we then continue to deliver, de de deliver it continuously, then we, we capture this value, and the value that we have, we already have it, so we reduce uncertainty, and we also get feedback, so this way we can actually be sure that we are working on something that, is, that someone out there is actually getting value from. The second piece, is the close collaboration between self-managing teams. Now, because you could have a feedback loop where we are sending stuff out, uh, putting it out there for the people to use, and then there's a product manager who collects this feedback, and then somehow this doesn't really make it to uh, the developers. And so you are still in the situation where developers don't know what they're building and why. So 
to solve that second piece, you really want to make sure that it's the whole team that's engaging with this problem rather than just individual people on it. And the approach, the sort of the high level approach on this from Agile is you really want self-managing teams that really work as a single team rather than having people who sort of go and figure things out and assign tasks. Now, I've also mentioned work in progress, right? So, I mean, work in progress is basically anything that you've started and haven't yet finished, right? Oftentimes, you have projects where someone says, well, I'm going to go and figure out the architecture for this, and they go and they work on something, and, you know, a month later, they're still working on it, and two months later, they're still working on it. What's the problem with that? Well, there are two problems. One is that you aren't really getting value, right? So, you, you, you have this work that you've done, but there is no value out of it, uh, because it's not out there uh, for users to be using. But the second one, and that's a bigger one, is that you actually don't know if you ever will, because you will only find out if whatever you're building is valuable once it's ready. And because of that, uh, any work in progress, you could think of it as a hypothesis, a question to which you haven't yet answered. So it becomes important to avoid to reduce the amount of work in progress so that you really could speed up that feedback loop. And Agile is really ultimately all about speeding up that feedback loop so that you're learning faster. And finally, uh, work in progress often in practice means that you're working on a bunch of things in parallel, and that really ends up being a massive productivity killer. How do we avoid uh, this? Well, one thing is we want to break up your work, right? So we want to take the, the work that you take, you want to think of it in terms of smaller and smaller, increasingly smaller chunks, and really take it in small bite size. And, uh, and, if, and if you find yourself taking on tasks that you can finish in a few days, then maybe you should be breaking it up a little bit even smaller. Uh, and you want to finish what you started, right? Again, like don't move on to the next item until you finish what you started, unless you really have come to a conclusion that that's no longer needed, in which case, obviously, you want to move on from that task as quickly as possible. So with this background, let's talk a little bit about Scrum, and in particular about doing Scrum by the book. Now, when I say by the book, this is the book. Uh, no, this, when we started really, when we decided to really seriously go all in on Scrum at Rangel, uh, I've got, I went and I looked at a bunch of books, and I really wanted everyone to be on the same page, and I really wanted us to, to kind of to try to do Scrum seriously before uh, improvising. And uh, this ended up being the book that I felt was the best singular introduction to Scrum, and I got a stack of those books, I swear, this tall, and I've handed this out to everyone, like everyone at, at Rangel got a copy, and then since then, we've been actually giving a copy to every person who just even comes for an interview, they get a copy of, of this book. Now, it's not the only book, and we've got plenty of other books uh, that we obviously use, but this is our introduction. Now, why Scrum? What's so great about it? Well, I'll quote this uh, book, um, Large Scale Scrum by Larman and Vodi, where they say that Scrum has been successful because it has presented an ideal balance between abstract principles and concrete practices, right? So I've talked so far about principles. And if I stay at that point, you could go home and you'll be sort of we'll go ba back to your workplace and you're going to not know what exactly to do about all of those ideas. Scrum actually gives you a number of concrete practices that you can really go ahead and follow. At the same time, it also leaves you room for improvisation, right? It's, um, so this makes Scrum a great place to start, right? Now, lots of um, teams sometime down the line find that other agile methodologies like, say, Kanban, actually work better for them, but Scrum is really the, the best place to start. It's not meant to be dogmatic. Uh, it's something that you should be, uh, you could be adapting to and uh, based on your learning, but I really want to stress that last point. People often start cherry picking with Scrum too early, and I think this is the number one reason why Scrum fails, right, is basically what people do is they say, well, Scrum is supposed to be adjustable. It's supposed to be I'm supposed to adapt it based on my learning, so I have zero experience with it so far, but the first thing I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start adapting it. And then they go look at it and they say, well, mm, this, this kind of makes sense. This kind of makes sense. This looks weird. I'm not going to do that. This looks weird. This doesn't fit our context. And so people just kind of go and they adapt it to their supposedly needs, but what they really do is they actually adapt it to their status quo, right? So they basically find a way then to only adapt those parts of Scrum that don't challenge the way they do things already. And what you get is basically kind of your existing status quo, existing process with like a, a thin veneer of Scrum that doesn't really, or oftentimes just Scrum terminology that doesn't really change anything. And so don't do that. 
instead, give proper Scrum a chance before experimenting. Like this is, I, I think if there is a singular idea I want to stress in this talk, it's that, right? Really try doing Scrum by the book before you start saying, well, this doesn't work. Because a lot of things uh, that may seem weird at first, they actually come to work later. Later down the line, a few months into it, you gotta start thinking, how do we actually make this better? But when you do that, you gotta ask yourself also, is this not working? Because that really is not a fit you know, for our specific situation, or is this not working because we haven't actually tried it enough, right? Say, for instance, let's say that you're introducing uh, stand-up uh, meetings, right? And stand-up meetings are supposed to be 15 minutes, and you're supposed to be doing them standing, right? And you, st and you, you, you kind of uh, do your hour-long meetings every morning where you're sort of sitting around the conference table for an hour. And then a few weeks later, people say, yeah, you know, we're wasting so much time. Well, you're wasting so much time because you're doing it wrong, right? Like, it's not like, uh, it takes, doesn't take a lot of analysis in this case to know that you are doing it wrong. So really, that's where I, what I mean by try doing Scrum by the book. So let me now say a few words about, well, what does doing Scrum by the book means? So let me talk about a couple of key practices. And I'll present them maybe if you've heard about, if you've been exposed to Scrum, and I'm guessing all of you have been exposed to a substantial extent, but you may find that the order in which I'm stressing them is a little different. So one is the Scrum team, right? That's the, the key sort of specific practice in Scrum is a Scrum team that consists of the following three roles, which is uh, a Scrum master, which is a person who is dedicated to making sure that we are actually following the process and making sure that the team gets unblocked, which is to say that basically getting rid of whatever is getting in the way of the team's pro uh, uh, progress. Uh, there's a product owner. This is the person who is ultimately, who has the ultimate authority to decide what we want to build, right? So when it comes to deciding do we want to build X or do we want to build Y, product owner is the person who makes that decision. And then last is team members. And in Scrum, the rest of the team is undifferentiated. There is no roles, there is no ranks, there is no levels. It's team members who are really meant to work together as peers to get to build the things that uh, are agreed upon as part of the um, uh, planning. So this is, this, is a, this is one point where a lot of uh, teams start adopting Scrum, but they immediately get off track because they say, well, we need team leads, right? No, you don't have team leads in Scrum. Give it a try, try it this way, right? So at, at Wrangle, we've taken this approach seriously. We don't have tech leads, we don't have team leads. We really try to get as close as we can to this approach. Scrum Master, product owner, in our case, the product owner is, uh, almost, is always uh, from the client, uh, unless it's an internal project, and uh, then team members who are really meant to be working uh, together without differentiation. Second idea is um, prioritized backlog of user stories. Uh, so th there's two parts there. One is that with Scrum, you don't work in terms of tasks. You work in terms of, your work is organized in terms of user stories, which are really meant to stress the tangible benefit that the end user is going to get out of it. Now, the reason you uh, want to do things this way, because this keeps you honest. This keeps you uh, focused on delivering stuff that actually is benefiting someone, as opposed to building those things like, oh, you know, like I'm, we're implementing, a, you know, something on the API side, but no one really knows why, right? The second key idea of the uh, key piece of this idea is prioritize backlog, right? So the idea is that we want to have a list of things uh, which can be fairly long that we want to, of what we want to build, but we want to know what is at the top. It's, pri it's a priority queue, right? Think of it that way. You want to know what are the things that you really need most, and the, idea, the key idea of Scrum is you always work on whatever it is that you need most, right? So you don't sort of go ahead and leave things that are important for later. I'll talk, I'll get back to this in a little bit because this was a, a one piece where we've experienced a lot of learning. Uh, third idea is time boxing through short sprints, which leads to shippable software. So the idea there is that we, we make a plan for two weeks, we, we try to get that done, and the, the goal is that whatever it is that we took on within those two weeks, so it could be a little bit longer, is going to actually be an incremental improvement to the product where something is going to get be, if not shipped, then at least be shippable at the end of this. This helps us stop work in progress and helps us really speed up that uh, feedback loop where we can be sure that we're building stuff that we want. 
Fourth, and this is often where people start, but this may be actually sort of fourth in priority, is Scrum ceremonies, which is the different meetings that Scrum organizes. And the key idea with those meetings really is not that how many you need and when, how long they should be, but that you want your whole team present at most of them. I mean, what you avoid in Scrum is this idea that there's gonna be one person who's gonna talk to the business analyst or to product owner, to whoever, and figure out what needs to be done and then give specific tasks to individual people. You really want to make sure that you have the whole team meeting the product owner and discussing what needs to be done and basically then saying, oh, you know what, I could do this piece and then maybe you could do that piece or vice versa. And last, but really, really not least, and in fact, this is the most important piece of Scrum, is retrospectives. Now, I find that this is the one piece that seems like companies out there are most likely to skip when it comes to Scrum. The idea of retrospective is that at the end of the sprint, your team gets together and they discuss what went well and what should be done differently next sprint. And the key idea is that you want your, sprint, your team to be learning and to be doing better from one sprint to another. So let me now talk about, so this is, this is come by the book. So those, those are the sort of the key things that you really should be putting in place if when you're trying Scrum. And this is, we, we, we did all of those and I'm really, they all worked out quite well for, that for us, but I want to now talk about some of the adjustments. So first one is actually maybe not really an adjustment as such, but really just rereading, kind of going back to the book and saying, you know what, like they really meant it, like this is really important. And this is the importance of prioritizing. I mean, prioritizing really, this is the heart of Scrum. If you are not prioritizing, if you're not working with a prioritized backlog, then you are not doing Scrum, you're not really doing Agile at that point. The reason this is so important is because this is what, so if, if, you don't, if you don't have a proper sense of prioritization, what ends up happening is that you start working on the items that you want to work on, but then something else comes up that's more important. Right? And when something else comes up that's more important, you end up spend working on that, you end up working on multiple things uh, in parallel, you end up having tons of work in progress, and you sort of, you don't really get done things that you want to get done. So what you want is you want to have a prioritized list that really ensures that when you focus on your work for the week, you know that this is the most important work that you could possibly be working on, right? That there's nothing is gonna derail you from getting this work done because it is the most important work. And this prioritization is sometimes challenging. And uh, there's a couple of questions that your team can ask to really um, help product owner make those decisions. Uh, one question is that what would we be work on if this was the last sprint? I mean, if this is like, if this last, if this next two weeks is all we've got and then we're shipping it, then what would we be working on, right? And chances are this is probably what you should be working on, right? Because oftentimes you naturally work in a different uh, flow, but it, 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 it actually is a good idea to sort of, to ask what, uh, this question and then you really get a sense of prioritization and then you could really get on, work on those. Another question to ask is, can we ship it yet? And if we can't ship it, then why not? And this really, those questions, they really help you kind of cut your requirements down to the absolute bare minimum. So let's imagine that you are building an e-commerce uh, site, right? And you could potentially be uh, ha working sort of with a list of requirements that are miles long and it's gonna take you months to implement it. And if you were to go that route, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be working on all sorts of different pieces and then, you know, six months into it, you know, three months before the deadline, you're gonna have no idea what's working and what's not working. So instead, if you really apply this kind of to a radical level, you could say, what's the absolute minimum thing we could do that's actually gonna be useful, right? Well, maybe, maybe most of your uh, sales actually come from three products. So maybe you should just put those three products up there. And maybe if you don't have the payment integration system in, maybe you should just put, list those three products and put a phone number underneath, right? And say, call this number and we're gonna ship it to you, right? Do things like that from which, which you can then establish as a base from which you could then build and extend uh, your product, always verifying that uh, users are actually getting value or your business is getting value out of the things that are being built. Now, the second thing that we have found is, um, is the importance of working with the product owner. Now, in our case, this is particularly um, an interesting point because uh, we are a professional services company, so our product owner comes from the client side. So in our case, in our typical engagement, usually um, our team that we provide has a decent amount of experience with Scrum. 
Uh, but for the product owner, that's a learning up, uh, experience, and they, they're new to Scrum, and we have to you know, sort of make sure that they bring, it, bring them on board. It's important that you get the right person, right? So sometimes we work with a client and we just discover that the person that got provided to us as a product owner is just not gonna be the right person for this. Now, when I say the right person, you need two things. That's kind of our, the metric that we use. You need someone who has authority to make decisions about the product, right? So if you have a product owner where every time there is a question, they will say, oh, well, you know, let me go and talk to my boss, then that person is not gonna, uh, you're not gonna be able to serve sort of to work uh, in tight feedback loop with, that, with this person because your, it's, you know, your, your, your feedback is always gets uh, disrupted by the fact that they need to go and actually look uh, for this additional authorization. Now, on the flip side, if you're working with someone who has ability to make decisions, but their schedule would not allow them to talk to your team more than once a month, then that's not gonna work either. So what we really always look for is someone who has, is, is this balance, enough authority to really be able to make decisions, at least for the duration, for the scope of the sprint, and at the same time, uh, enough availability so that this person could actually be there uh, available to our team and ideally on a daily basis, on the very least on a, on a weekly basis. Um, in our case, oftentimes we found that much of our Scrum Master's work is actually working with the product owner. Again, because the team often knows they've been through Scrum before, uh, the product owner uh, needs to be coached. And uh, there we've often found that it requires flexible arrangements. We, um, different approaches work for different product owners, and while we have sort of an ideal form way of working with the product owner, oftentimes we need to improvise a little bit. So for instance, we really prefer product owners to write their own user stories. Uh, in, on some of our engagements, we'll say, you know what, the person who have the authority to make those decisions, they are not gonna be able to do that we need to write uh, those user stories together with them, or maybe in some cases even instead of them, even though there are some risks associated with that. The other um, issue here is that we found is that it's important, in particular when working with a product owner, is finding a way to handle their commitments. Right? Oftentimes, you know, the product owner would sort of approach the situation from, when we say, well, let's prioritize, they say, well, no, no, I need all of it. Right? Now, if we really just sort of go and say, well, you need all of this, sure, sure, let's plan to build all of this. Well, that's, that's gonna create, create a problem because if you don't prioritize, you work on sort of things in, uh, out of order and then you don't necessarily get them working and then you're not getting this feedback and then you know, a month before the deadline, you're just still not sure of what you've got. So we find usually that we need to kind of push back on that, but it's important to, as we do that, it becomes really important to think of, well, what are their commitments? When they say need all of this, what does this really mean? Why do they need all of this, right? Like, they're, they're not just saying this because they're trying to be difficult. Uh, they may be saying this because there are certain promises that were made to uh, their superiors, to maybe their clients, in which case we try to go ahead and, and understand, well, what were the promises that can, were made? How can those promises be fulfilled? And really sort of engage with this at that level. Uh, the second issue is scope discovery. Now, I'm not talking here about feature creep because I mean, Scrum is usually fairly good at, at dealing with feature creep, but there's this thing called scope discovery, which is basically as you start working on the project, it turns out that there are things that are absolutely needed. They just sort of no one really remembered to mention, right? Uh, I know maybe you're building an e-commerce website and you just sort of forgot that at the end of the day it actually needs to have payment integration because, and it's kind of not very useful without it, and you probably should have worked on payment integration first, right? So, so those kind of things. So there we find it's important to have a certain balance. You don't want to do um, kind of detailed planning and architecture diagrams up front and sort of plan everything out and then kind of fall into waterfall mode. But it is important to have enough of a scope discovery conversations with the client that you really understand what are all the different things that are potentially needed so that you could really start prioritizing out of that full set of things and then you could really say that you know what, of all of those things that you mentioned, it sounds like payment integration is probably the most important thing, right? Because if your clients aren't gonna be able to pay and it doesn't make shopping cart without product, uh, you know, payment integration doesn't make a lot of sense. Payment integration without shopping cart, well, that's not the best user experience, but that's a lot better than the other way around, right? So this is where you need to kind of do scope discovery first and then start prioritizing. 
The third, and this is probably the singular most important thing that we found when working with uh, product owners, and in particular dealing with their commitments, is building trust. That ultimately, you, uh, people are used to working with software projects where everything goes wrong, right? Where they're working on it for months and they see some demos, but they sort of know that those demos are smoke and mirrors and they know that when, when the time is going to be up, they're going to be left holding the bag, getting nothing. And this is unfortunately just much too common of an experience, and which is why it's really important to not just have a process that uh, delivers, but have a process that delivers in a way, delivers early in a way that uh, the product owner feels comfortable and they know that they're not, they're going to be getting, uh, you know, no, Scrum helps in this sense quite a bit by delivering value early so you can really show that value, but it's important to really do that showing piece first. The other part of it is oftentimes we find that some of the uh, process improvements we need to postpone them until a little bit later once we have built up enough trust with the client so we no, do not necessarily want to come in and say, you know, here is the right way to do everything. Uh, we need to find their level of comfort and then uh, start delivering and then get to a point where they say, you know what, we can see that this is now working better than anything we've seen before. Maybe we actually want to try more of, of, the, of those ideas. The um, other idea that um, we've really found, we've, we've started with Scrum and we found oftentimes that while the idea of Scrum is, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how um, Scrum for better or worse have sort of ended up getting a bad name. Uh, on the flip side, continuous delivery is really another term for basically in many ways I would say the same thing that is a lot easier for people to understand, right? So this is the one piece. So when you think of Scrum, you need to think of Scrum as really being ultimately about continuous delivery of software, right? And I've sort of stressed this before, but it's worth just sort of also try that alternative term for size. Now, again, continuous delivery of working software, so it helps reduce uncertainty and build trust, right? And this, in, that's why I'm saying that this is essentially the most important idea of Scrum. Now, continuous integration is uh, something else that you want, right? Which is a slightly different idea, but it's closely related. And which is that as you have your software, as you're working on your software in this incremental manner, you want to make sure that your continue that your working software actually continues working, right? And that you don't actually break it and sort of have this continuous cycle of bug fixing. So continuous integration is a really important piece of that that we really stress on all of our projects and kind of keep being surprised how few um, companies actually really do that properly. It's, it's really important. And in order to support this, again, the sort of keeping your working software working, we find it's really important to adopt the proper Git workflow. Now, when I say proper Git workflow, it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be sort of 17 different branches with like complicated rules about how they interact. We follow a fairly simple workflow, and really the, our workflow can be sum, summed up in three words, reviewed pull requests. People work in pull requests, and those pull requests get merged into master after being reviewed. And ideally, they should be reviewed for both for code quality and for whether the code that is actually being uh, delivered actually works, right? So you would want to set up your continuous um, integration pipeline so that you have an environment set up for every pull request. So the person reviewing the pull request could say, hey, uh, this code looks good, but let me see if it actually still works, right? And oftentimes, they, they would be able to say, well, you know, this code is changing stuff in this library. I want to go and see if that button still works. And so they could do that. So in that sense, very simple Git workflow, but it's really important to stick with it. And we've been kind of religious about it. You know, like I have, you know, as a CTO, obviously, uh, admin access to our entire, uh, you know, Git uh, set of Git repositories. I would not ever merge anything untested uh, without having it reviewed by someone, right? Uh, because again, the idea is that you really want to establish that practice that oh, everyone uh, pull requests need to get reviewed. And you learn, even as CTO, you learn a lot of really interesting things when other people look at your code on per pull request basis. Now, just as an aside, we also stress uh, code reviews in the um, kind of more traditional sense where there is someone who would kind of sit down and do a, a code walkthrough with you. Uh, we do that, we try to do it every few weeks. 
I do not see as a replacement for really code review on per pool request because this is this is where it's someone on your team and they can really get into details and they could think of like how exactly will this change that you're introducing potentially uh, impact your application and th that really goes a long way to ensure that your working software stays working software. And finally, continuous deployment. Now, ideally, you would want to be deploying at the end of each pull request, uh, at the end of each um, uh, of each sprint, but ideally even at the end of each pull request, you would be actually deploying to production. Now, this depends on your client's comfort, obviously, or our client's comfort with this. So in the very least, what we do is we make sure that there is deployment, continuous deployment to staging. Now, when I say staging, what I mean is that we actually have, would normally have an environment that is accessible to the client all the time, so the product owner can go and see it every time, and it gets updated immediately upon every pull request. So part of it is that as a developer, you know that, uh, as a developer, but also as a reviewer of a pull request, you know that uh, when you're going to hit this merge button, it's going to be available to the product owner in five minutes. And uh, if, if you're breaking it, they're going to see it. So th this is really important. Finally, I did actually a longer talk at, uh, on continuous delivery at Web Unleashed last year. So if you're interested, then you could check it out there. It's uh, bit.ly slash yuri cd 2015. This was last year on the same stage. Now, another interesting um, topic that we've run into is what happens to, how do you handle QA in the context of an agile process? And this is oddly something that we didn't really, at first we thought that, well, there is no, doesn't seem to be clear answers. Then we reread the book because I'm saying it's we've tried really to do everything by the book, and the book actually gives a fairly straightforward answer, which is that there are no roles. There are no roles on the Scrum team, so there is no QA role. So this this is the one thing we've struggled with a little bit because, as we see, it, there are people out there who really understand quality. They understand quality in ways that a lot of developers don't. In particular. Uh, they are skilled at thinking about the off the happy path, right? So the developers often think, okay, well, here's, here's the normal things that are going to happen, but there is, they don't often think enough about all of the weird things that can happen. And there are people who have basically spent a lot of their time training their mind, thinking about all of the bad things that can happen. So how do you integrate them into this? Well, our solution has been, that we've discovered, is to forego the traditional QA responsibilities, but at the same time bring those people uh, in the team and really and so br or bring them to Wrangle and then bring them onto our teams uh, so that we could have that expertise. But to in have those people involved early in the process and have them focus on preventing defects rather than finding them, right? So in, what I mean, for instance, is that oftentimes the way a lot of companies do QA, right, is that you have... Um, Developers develop and then they throw it over to QA and then QA is like this like the gotcha moment, right? Now you're gonna catch them not having thought about the different things that they should have thought, right? And it shouldn't be like that, right? Instead, what we wanna do is we say, well, I mean, there are people who are who can foresee those problems, right? They and they could demonstrate their ability to think about those potential problems when the software is in front of them, but they could also bring that knowledge early in the process, where when we are discovering this, discussing the story, they could say, you know what? How is this supposed to work when the user does the following, right? And then this gives us an opportunity to actually discuss this and to prioritize and maybe make a decision, say that, you know what, this is the case that we're not gonna handle or saying that, you know what, yeah, we really, really do need to handle that case, but actually the fact that we've added this now means that the, there's a lot more work, and we probably should not take this whole uh, story into the sprint, but maybe split it in half, right? So that's the way uh, we've been integrating QA. And then finally, we stress on doing testing within the sprint. Uh, so instead of basically having developers do, and the reason for this is, the same mantra that I've repeated before is, a, is limiting work in progress, right? Because if you finished a story and you haven't shipped it, then that means you're not done because the story is going to come back to you, right? Uh, QA is going to look at it and they're going to come back and say, hey, by the way, we found those bugs and now you're going to sort of have to reopen this, right? So and also it means obviously that you cannot ship it to the client because you don't know if it works. So that's why we stress that regardless of who does testing, whether it's people who are sort of testing professionals or if it's um, 
just members of the team. Uh, this testing should happen within the sprint, and better yet, it should happen within the pull request, right? And so we're kind of coming back to the idea that ideally you would have an environment set up for every pull request where before merging that pull request, uh, whoever is reviewing it could go ahead and verify that it actually does what it's supposed to do and that it doesn't break anything else. The other area of learning for us and uh, has been project kickoffs. That's been interesting because uh, we do a lot of short projects and we really want to um, be able to start a new project early and build confidence uh, with the client quickly. And, but what's getting in the way is that there is lack of common ground. Right? So we start working with the client. The team is new to this. I mean, they, 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 they have, so they're starting on this project today. They, they may potentially know close to nothing about it. So we've worked on developing a process for, um, oh, and then sometimes there actually isn't really common ground even on the client's team. That's something that we've found often is that the client um, team comes to us and we discover that they actually have different ideas about where the product needs to go, right? So that needs to be reconciled too, and that obviously adds to the complexity. So we have tried to solve this by developing a process that we call Clarity Canvas, which is basically a process for establishing common ground quickly through a series of workshops where we work with the client to, uh, with the client and the team. So we bring several, many people, a number of people from the client's team, a number of people from our team, uh, or, or pretty much everyone from our team, uh, and then they work together, they go through a series of workshops where we really try to get to a common understanding what is the product trying to achieve, what the user's ex or high level user experience gonna be, what users needs this product is ultimately gonna serve, what are the risks, uh, what are some of the business factors. So we go through this process and we try to, um, we try to limit, we try to do enough of that so we can really get started on the right foot. But at the same time, it's worth noting that it's important to keep it limited to uh, maybe a few days because we also want to jump into the mode of actually delivering software early. And obviously if we spend the first month just talking about it, then we cannot be delivering that software where we could be uh, getting feedback and validating. Extending the same idea, we have um, adopted an approach to user experience that we, that's uh, known as Lean UX. So the main idea of Lean UX is you avoid the really long uh, design ahead of time. And in particular now, this gets a little tricky because sometimes clients may come with designs done ahead of time. Now if you sort of say that, well, the design is fixed, this is what it needs to be, then you are back to a uh, fixed scope where you cannot really prioritize. Uh, ideally, uh, what we want to do is to actually have a start with a fairly high level idea of, of what are the different steps that the user is going to go through, identify the most important path, and then start getting more depth on design as we're actually building it ideally within the sprint. Now, you also, it's important, I mentioned before that users don't always know what they want, but they're still one of your better sources on that. So it's important to talk to users. And, but it really helps to do that within the sprint, right? So instead of doing kind of long, extensive user studies, what we uh, really prefer is to actually do something that's fairly quick where we get feedback uh, ideally within the sprint where we've, we've built this and now let's go ahead and actually um, try it with a few people and see what they said and ideally you actually can incorporate this feedback immediately. And uh, the third idea is that we are increasingly now looking into leveraging analytics, right? And really making sure that we're not just incorporating feedback from the people who, to whom we showed it and with whom we discussed it, but that because oftentimes people say that they want one thing, but they actually do something else. And, and analytics, basically instrumenting your app so that you could get that data really helps you sort of see what users actually do with your site. And you could see that, well, they say they love something, but when you add it to the site, uh, then to your app, then suddenly your engagement drops and things like that. One last thing is I want to talk a little bit about, I've called this uh, talk process hacking, and this really comes from the idea that Scrum has a sort of a funny status at this point. It's kind of, the following two statements seem to be simultaneously true, which is everyone does Scrum today and also no one does Scrum today. And really what this means is that everyone does today something that they call Scrum, but it sort of ends up being just, you know, doing whatever it is that they've been doing before, but now calling it Scrum. And uh, because of that, we've found that oftentimes people are quite jaded about Scrum. Like a lot of people have had experience with Scrum and they can sort of say, yeah, I know what, we've worked with it, it doesn't work. So part of it is, 
is, is being creative about terms and being creative about selling points and really focusing on principles and benefits rather than focusing on individual terminology and sort of kind of taking the approach that goes by any other name, just a tweet. I, I'm out of time, so I will just say one word about this, which is that next uh, step after you've been successful in integrating uh, Scrum in your project teams, really look into um, whether you could really uh, build your organization around Scrum. And this is what we've been really trying to do, is really say that this approach that has been working for us on, uh, on project teams, it can really work on how we run Rangel. And a lot of, we, we follow a lot of the same approaches. Now, in practice, we often end up leaning on Kanban for internal projects, because I said this is kind of oftentimes when you have a more mature team, that's where you would want to transition eventually. But I highly advise everyone to think of how can you apply Agile principles to your organization. Thank you. And I believe we are out of time, so I don't know if we have time for proper questions, but I'll stick around, and anyone who wants to ask me questions, that's, le that's legit? Yeah. So I'll stick around, and anyone who wants to ask questions, just come by and I'll answer them. Thank you.